Life Audio. This is Empowering Homeschool Conversations. We want families to come here and gain insightful strategies that empower them to successfully teach diverse learners at home. Hosted by founder and CEO of Sped Homeschool, Peggy Ployer. Our goal is that these powerful weekly conversations will boost your confidence to cultivate the best at-home learning environment for your student. For more homeschool resources, go to spedhomeschool.com. You're listening to Empowering Homeschool Conversations with Peggy Ployer. We'll start the conversation with Peggy and her guests next. The best-selling illustrative Bible for kids and teens, the Action Bible, is now better than ever. The Action Bible Faith in Action Edition is an interactive Bible specifically created for kids and teens ages 7 to 15. The Faith in Action Edition is designed to engage young readers in God's Word through hundreds of vividly illustrated Bible stories in chronological order with activities and games. Readers will grow in God's Word by using QR codes, providing free access to over 2,000 and devotionals, hundreds of prayers, character stories, teaching videos, maps, timelines, and much more. Additionally, the Action Bible Faith in Action Edition allows readers to explore the major themes of the Bible like courage, faith, hope, love, service, trust, and wisdom. Each theme provides practical advice on how to live out God's Word. The Action Bible Faith in Action Edition is the best interactive Bible you can purchase for your child or teen. Purchase your copy today at Sam's Club, Barnes & Noble, or Amazon. Do you want to better understand the Bible and give biblical answers to those who ask you about your faith? Hi, this is Perseus Poku, host of the Sound Reasoning Podcast Show. Listen to us weekly as we bring the truth often found in the ivory towers of seminary down to the steeple towers of local church. Join me along with many of the nation's top theologians as we offer answers to life tough questions from an apologetic perspective. Subscribe to the show at lifeaudio.com. This is Empowering Homeschool Conversations, provided by Sped Homeschool, a nonprofit that empowers families to home educate diverse learners. To learn more, visit spedhomeschool.com. Here's Peggy Ployer. My guest again didn't show up, but prayed about that. And I have decided to take a little different strategy um, for today's broadcast. I'm going to take the questions that were submitted for my guest and answer them to my best ability. And I've also come up with some other questions that have come across my desk over the last couple of weeks um, and through various conversations. And I thought I would share with you my responses to those. I'm also going to welcome any live questions. So if you are joining me live, whether on YouTube or Facebook, I am yours for the next hour. And um, I would just love to be able to answer any questions, um, calm any fears, um, kind of put away any anxiety as the new school year is coming up. I know as working as a special needs consultant for two different state organizations and now running SPED Homeschool for um, over six years now, I've answered a lot of questions, and this is usually the busiest time of month when um, families are just scrambling to figure out how they're going to do it, if they're going to do it, um, and if they can just make it work for their student, and if it's a better option than going the route to public school, private school, how do we homeschool? Let's let's talk about that today. So, um, first of all, I um I had the opportunity last night to sit down with a young mom from my church and she had attempted at least that was her word attempted homeschooling um in the past and was really trying to figure out what to do um with a child who's very much that she butted heads with. So what do you do with a a child who you butt heads with and doesn't want to do what you want to do? Well, Let's talk about that. Um, my my questions for her really focused around a lot about what her child does do. Um, I think a lot of times we have this idea of what school should look like, and 
through anxiety, a variety of different things, our kids either just put themselves down, they, they pretty much have convinced themselves they can't learn, or they, they're at a place where they're so burnt out from what they think learning is that they don't even want to attempt it anymore. So we have to make learning fun again. And that is takes time because we have to heal wounds. There is some trauma involved with learning. Um, and sometimes that's within the school system and sometimes that's from at home. I've had people on my show who have basically unconvinced their kids that homeschooling was the best route when um, when they homeschooled in the past and and kind of had to reinvent homeschooling before they they brought their kids back home again and attempted it a, a second time and you know what god knows all the things that are going to go in our school right and wrong and we just can't beat ourselves up about all those those things we just have to take one day at a time what we know to do and how to move forward with it best so going back to this question that this mom had for me that i met for coffee last night um we talked a lot about interests and if you have a child who has extreme interests a lot of times it's really hard to get them to switch gears to do school based around what you're interested in them learning. And so you kind of have to trick them um, into understanding that finding out more about things that they love and kind of integrating it into just practices of, of discovery and um, asking questions, finding out answers. That's what learning really is. And kids have questions. They want their questions answered. And they will pursue that if they're interested. And so um, so start thinking about first, and this is what I posed to this mom, was what is it that you don't have to ask your child to do, that they just do? And what are the subjects that they're focused in on and could probably spend most of the day doing. And because those are the things that fuel their questions, fuel their learning. And that is where you're going to have to turn school. It may not look like school as you have seen it in your past, as you see it in other people's homeschools, but it's going to ignite that love of learning. It's going to heal some of those learning um, the places where learning has really been a struggle for your student and, and maybe clear up that they aren't as unintelligent as they think they are, that they have a lot to offer. They have a lot of questions that um, they can can provide answers to, and they can teach other people about the things they're excited about. And um, so... I don't know if your child has the same interests as that this this mom that I talked to last night. Her child did, but um, she said that her child likes to draw a lot. And so we talked about how could you funnel that drawing into a project, and and so that your your student would have something that they could showcase what they love to do the most. And so we talked about them making a magazine over the year. And using some different writing techniques, um, I suggested a curriculum. Clearwater Press has a, um, they also, they have how to write a novel in a year. That's way too complicated, um, especially for the age level that we were talking about last night. But um, they also have one on how to write a, a magazine. It has a bunch of different like short um, writing projects in there. Um, and that's what I did with my daughter to get her to start writing was she was very interested in art. And so she, we had her illustrate this um, magazine and then she threw in her writing as well. And um, then we, we self-published it at the end of the year. And it, how exciting to have something that showcases what you love to do the most. And so the, the artwork definitely fueled the writing. The writing wasn't what was driving that project, um, but we had to fill the rest of the pages with something. And and so, so think about that. If you have a child that struggles in one area, what is another area that they really excel in 
that you could focus that learning around and then kind of encourage the stuff that that they they don't think they do well at where a lot of kids have lots of great ideas they just think writing is so tedious and um and such a process so um yes so so think about that if um if you're kind of butting heads with your student another thing um because that was the main question with the mom that I was talking with last night if you're butting heads with your student think about areas where they want to know answers, where their attention is focused. And of course, if you have a child um, with more spectrum types of issues, they can get highly focused on something. And and so turn that into a school um, subject and, and figure out how you can add categorization in there, how you can add field trips in there, how you can add counting with, with those objects. I know when my middle child loved superheroes and did not like word problems. So I just changed all the word problems to have superheroes in them. And he did those problems so fast when he knew that what he was adding up, figuring out involved his favorite thing. So, so those are just some really easy, creative ways to get your child engaged in learning, especially when they're oppositional about learning and they think that they don't learn well because really they do, but um, there's a lot of roadblocks that could be in the way and and just kind of easing into that to, to let go of what you think school should look like so that school can become a good experience for your child. And a lot of you might be thinking, but no, we're not checking off the boxes. We're not doing what's grade appropriate. Um, probably not. But I want you to think about the long-term benefits of teaching this way. If you teach what's on the list, yes, your child will have had that information put in front of them. What gets absorbed? Not much because they're not interested. They're not engaged. Um, they don't really care. And when you don't care about something, I don't know about you, but if you were told to read, you know, a pamphlet about something that you had no working knowledge of, no exposure to, and um, it was just an assignment to get through the book, you'd probably only remember a, well, very small part of it, and anything that somehow hinged on something that you had had experience with. That's kind of what your kids do when they, they do the school you put in front of them. If they have nothing to relate it to, it's just a task. And the task goes in one ear, out the other, um, through their eyeballs, and out the back of their head. And that's it. They just, they, they're not absorbing. But what if your child is focused on something that they love. They're learning that they can learn, that they can find answers to the questions that they have, that they can start telling people about the things that they're excited about and add on to that by information that they found out from other people that are excited about the same things they're excited about. That's when you have engagement and that's when you see learning explode. Statistics now say that kids graduating from high school right now will have seven careers in their lifetime. Which type of learner is going to be able to reinvent themselves seven times or more? If you have a younger child right now, they're going to that statistic is going to go up even more as we become in this fast-paced world that we are in. Things change so quickly. Jobs that your kids are going to have in the future a lot of them don't even exist. So how do we prepare them for that? We teach them to love to learn. And how we do that, we get into those things that they love and we teach them how to learn. And we teach them that it's exciting, that it's fun, and that we um, we can we can enjoy this process. It's not tedious. It's, it's something that we can do together. So, um, so I want you to just kind of, kind of think about that. And, um, and 
as you're kind of approaching the school year and maybe a lot of anxiety about, oh, I don't want those struggles. That parenting anger is coming back in. I, I know I've been there. Um, I lived through those, those anxiety moments too and finally learned I had to let go and just teach my kids where they were at and to help them to learn to learn. After a word from our sponsor, we'll dive back into this conversation. The best-selling illustrative Bible for kids and teens, the Action Bible, is now better than ever. The Action Bible Faith in Action Edition is an interactive Bible specifically created for kids and teens ages 7 to 15. The Faith in Action Edition is designed to engage young readers in God's Word through hundreds of vividly illustrated Bible stories in chronological order with activities and games. Readers will grow in God's Word by using QR codes, providing free access to over 2,000 and devotionals, hundreds of prayers, character stories, teaching videos, maps, timelines, and much more. Additionally, the Action Bible Faith in Action Edition allows readers to explore the major themes of the Bible like courage, faith, hope, love, service, trust, and wisdom. Each theme provides practical advice on how to live out God's Word. The Action Bible Faith in Action Edition is the best interactive Bible you can purchase for your child or teen. Purchase your copy today at Sam's Club, Barnes & Noble, or Amazon. Hello, hello, Quinice Petway here, co-host of the Your Daily Bible Verse podcast. Are you someone who loves to take a deep dive into God's Word, one verse at a time, to explore His will for your life, and desire to draw closer to Him? If that sounds like you, I'd love to invite you to head over to lifeaudio.com and search Your Daily Bible Verse to tune in and subscribe for daily inspiration, life application, and spiritual transformation through the in-depth exploration of God's Word. This is Empowering Homeschool Conversations, provided by Sped Homeschool. Go to spedhomeschool.com to get resources and support for teaching your unique learner at home. There were some questions, so that's that's the first thing I wanted to talk about. There are some questions that were submitted for my guest that was supposed to be on the show today that um, didn't come. <laughs> so I thought I would do my best to um, to answer some of those and and see what I can give you for answers. Um, we were going to talk about. Um, helping disorganized children learn with confidence. Um, I had a couple disorganized kids. Actually, my middle one was was the most or- disorganized out of the, the whole bunch. Um, can't say I was the perfect parent for for that, um, but do have some strategies. And so the the first question was from Susan P. And she said, "Are you talking about a child with disorganized thoughts? I have one of those." Um, a lot of times those kids with their disorganized thoughts just have a lot of thoughts. And sometimes they just need to slow those thoughts down and um, or they need to get a lot out so that they can really think. And so getting them to kind of explode on you and be a note taker and get all of it out of their head to somewhere where they can see it, um, somewhere where they can manipulate it, and it's not all in the same place. And that may um, may look different for um, different kids, but having like a debriefing in the morning um, may be the best way to actually start your day. What are you thinking about? What What is important to you today? Let's talk about that against our schedule that we have. And a lot of times with my, my kids, I didn't like jump the schedule to where we were starting that day. I had kind of rehearsed the schedule with my kids like days before. So a lot of times when we were tucking in to go to bed at night, I would rehearse the schedule for tomorrow, the next day, maybe the week out of all the important stuff coming up. But the daily schedule for tomorrow was definitely something we talked about because I found that when my kids woke up in the morning, they had a set of priorities in their head too. And if my priorities butted heads with their priorities and we didn't find a way to make everything mesh together well, that's when the explosions happened. Um, So it was opening up doors of communication, but also kind of investigating what was not being communicated 
and where those barriers were. So, so think about kind of that debriefing time and helping your child to visually, if they're a visual learner, helping them to visually picture that. If they're an auditory learner, walk through it by reading it back out loud to them and then continuing to discuss it. Maybe putting some pictures on the schedule where their things fit into that too. Um, it just lets them know also that you are thinking about them and prioritizing them instead of just yourself. Um, it's, it's so easy to get caught up with, with what we feel needs to be done and forget the child in the process. Um, that is something we don't want to do. And for kids that are super sensitive, we have to really be even more careful with that to just not let them get lost in the mix. So, um, so that's my advice on that. Yes, disorganized thoughts. Um, let's help them to organize them. Eventually, this is going to be a life skill that they need to know how to do anyways. So, so help them learn to think through that, learn how to use different um, aids or helps to get their disorganized thoughts organized. Um, the next question um, was from Carl Dad L. And they asked, um, what is your best advice to help my daughter who seems not to find priorities without losing my coolness? Um, and this goes back again to what I was talking about firsthand is, is we have priorities. Our children have priorities. And I guess this is kind of becoming the theme now of my, my time with you is that we need to have a relationship and relationships mean that everybody's priorities are at least listened to. And your child needs to realize there's priorities in your household. There's priorities that you have as a parent, but that there's priorities that everyone in the household has a listening ear um, from everybody else, that they have the ability to speak and to be heard and to be understood. And, and so sometimes we can lose our coolness um, when our child doesn't get heard because we're not listening and we're only listening to, to ourselves. Um, and losing our cool really doesn't get our child's attention. It just throws them off of what they were thinking about. Um, it doesn't mean that it doesn't still matter to them. They just either stuff it down inside or explode back at you, um, which both aren't good. So, so let's have those conversations um, and, and find those priorities and where we can meet and agree that certain priorities happen. Now, I will say that if you're kind of going through the de-schooling process right now, or you're just starting to homeschool, it's going to be harder to be on the same page with your student as yourself as to what is the priority. Because homeschooling has not become a way of living in your house. I I realized that it took us about two years before my kids realized that, oh, this is the way we do things here. <laughs> we get up and we do school, but I had to keep a pretty consistent schedule. Not that we had to do it every day, but my kids had to know that this was kind of how we flew, flew that how things, you know, just flowed at our house. And, and then all of a sudden they would just pick up their books and do their things. And I remember stepping back the first time I realized it was happening and went, ah, oh, it's happening. <laughs> I didn't think it ever would. Um, but, but it does take a long time to develop new habits. And that is exactly what has to happen. And so you will find yourself with a lot more um, butting heads, um, discussions, all of those things when you first start homeschooling, because it's something new. Nobody, I mean, you probably have in your mind um, what it should look like. It doesn't mean your kids have in their mind what that's going to look like and how they're going to be um, compliant to that either. That's just a process. So, so take it slow. Uh, speaking of time, the next question was from Valerie and she asked, my child has no concept of time. We have used timers planners and calendars. What other tools should we use? So a lot of children that don't have concept of time, sometimes their brains work too fast or too slow, or they're so focused on something that time disappears. 
And for those of us on the spectrum, time can just disappear because we could become so highly focused that there's nothing else except what we're focused on. So um, a lot of times those visual timers with the red um, on them that show and it's it's turning and visually for them to be able to see um, is one of the best ones that I have um, come across. Um, you may have like a countdown clock, um, but you need to make those timers very short periods of time if you do use them. Don't use them for lengthy because they'll just be be forgotten. But also you want to make sure that your um, when you schedule things, that you don't make them long either. Attention spans in kids are so short. Attention spans in adults are short. So <laughs> what are you going to do? Um, you're going to make everything short and you're going to vary it up um, and it can stay on the same topic but that the, the activity that you're doing may change in the middle. Um, you might just take a brain break. There's a lot of different ways, ways to do that. And so, um, so just know that there's, there's some things that you can do that will help a lot with helping your child to learn the concept of time. Some kids, it's just going to take time to learn time. And so I'm going to go back to what I was talking to a while ago about about doing those verbal schedules and talking to your kids, like when they're going to bed at night, this is what we're going to do the next day. And this is kind of the schedule that tomorrow is going to look like. And, and here's the, the big important things that we have coming up this week. As your children get older, they will start to integrate that thinking into their own thinking and start to process out, oh, this is what I have to do tomorrow. Um, my kids watch me too. I'm one of these, I have to have a paper written schedule. Yes, I also have an online schedule. I actually duplicate it everywhere because um, I need those reminders too. And those are just things I've learned about myself. Um, my daughter uses timers as well for, for various things. Um, and they have to learn what works for them. And, and so giving them the ability to fail in that and to try things out to see what helps them to remember things, to stay on time, to keep a schedule, to do their tasks. That is a whole learning process and another life skill as well. So, so don't think about it as they're not there yet. Just think about, okay, if they're not there, what can we try? What do you want to try? And have these discussions with your kids if they are able to have these discussions. Um, at, when they get older too, I would send my daughter off and say, you know what? There's some really good apps for that. Why don't you maybe download a couple and, and try them out and then see which one works the best for you and then pick that one. Use it for a while. If it doesn't work, it's not a failure. You just learn what you didn't like about it. Then try something else. So that's what we all do. But you have to give your child the opportunity to be able to do that on their own and, and maybe do that with them when they're first getting started so that they learn these organization skills and how to keep track of those things. So eventually, when they do leave, move out, go to, you know, go to school, get a job, they can do this for themselves. They're not going to be calling you. <laughs> Hopefully not, right? <laughs> um, so yeah, so those are their answers to those questions. Um, I also got a question from Latoya S. who asked, is it possible to homeschool with success a special ed child? Well, um, yes. <laughs> I've, I've homeschooled my oldest, who was diagnosed on the spectrum at age five. He is now 26. Um, he homeschooled the entire way through. Um, he is now a biomedical engineer living on his own. I never thought that would happen. But year by year, we just kept persevering. We taught where he was at. I'm going to share just a little bit of his story because I think this is really encouraging to a lot of uh, parents when they hear this because you can say, oh, yeah, well, you were a good educator, you know, and you, you knew what to do. No, I did not. Um, I walked into my homeschool journey. My son was suicidally depressed. I was suicidally depressed. I had anger issues. He had anger issues. Um, it was not a good picture, to say the least. 
But we trusted that God had something for us and that this was his call to our family and for how he wanted this child taught as well as his siblings. And so trusting in God, we started. And it wasn't, um, we lived in a state um, for the first well, all through his homeschooling in the state of Minnesota, which required us to do testing every year. So I knew where he was at because the tester told me where he was at. And really, I didn't need the testing to tell me that he couldn't read at age 11. Um, But what he could do was he could do math and he could do math really well. And he could actually, he had just the brain of an engineer. And so we started doing mechanical engineering in fifth grade, even before he was reading. We, I was teaching him structural engineering concepts. We were building with connects, historical bridges, talking about structures and how structures supported things. Um, and fueling, like I was talking about way at the beginning, fueling that, um, that desire to want to know more and to to feed that and to teach him that he wasn't stupid just because he couldn't read. It's just nothing that just wasn't clicking yet. But there was was things that he was so gifted at and he wanted to keep feeding that and not just saying, well, let's do more reading because that's something you're not good at. Well, I just gave him a bunch of audiobooks and said, I, you know, my goal is that you love to read. Eventually you will love to read. And and so so that's what I did. I gave him audiobooks and it wasn't the audiobooks I would have chose. It was ones that he was interested in. So the Chronicles of Narnia got listened to in our house over and over and over and over again. And when he turned 12, we took testing again. And guess what? I knew he was reading and, but he was reading at a college level. He actually asked if he could read the Iliad and the Odyssey, the unabridged version that next year. So um, it it was just exciting to see him take off in, in learning things that I, I really thought, you know, in the back of my mind, I never verbally said them. This is not going to happen. There's, there's no way this child is ever going to learn. Um, and especially with my deficits, I didn't even know what phonics was when I started homeschooling. I, I just came in so blind. Um, I have a degree in physics. I could teach math to, and science till the cows come home. But, you know, reading, that, that was a, a gift of God that all three of my children can read. Um, so, so, yes. But did it surprise me that um, eventually he wanted to go to college to become an engineer? No, that was what he was interested in. That's the the fire that I fueled um, throughout his homeschooling journey. And and eventually it paid off in that. So, um, so anyways, I just want to encourage you. Yes, you can homeschool. That was your, the original question was, can I homeschool um, a a child with successfully um, who has special education issues. Yes. And if you want to hear more stories, I have probably a hundred or more guests on this, sh- on my show over the years who have said the same thing. Listen to their stories, be encouraged by them. There's podcasts to download. If that's easier for you, videos to watch on our YouTube channel, but but just know that you are not the first person to do this. I felt like I was just because there was no resources when I did it. Um, you know, I homeschooled for 19 years and all three of my kids struggled in some way. And um, I made it through. It changed me. It changed my kids. And it was all for the better, too. So, yes, you can. And um, we are here to help. So um, I hope that was an encouraging answer to your question, LaToya. Um, okay, so next question. How do I begin homeschooling with my four and a half year old autistic ADHD child? Marsha D asked that question. How do you begin? Well, you begin by increasing curiosity in your child. Age four and a half is so young. Let them play. You would not, the studies now that exist about cross-body movement 
and play and learning and in the engagement of a child who can use their body and um, and it allows the different sides of the brains to talk to each other. I interviewed a woman on this show long, long ago who said that when they were when she was trained in the 60s to be a kindergarten teacher, she was told they were told just not to teach a child to even do pre-reading things until they could do the monkey bars. Now, that seems kind of weird, doesn't it? And then unfortunately, a lot of monkey bars are being removed from our public schools and parks. I was just told that by parents that come, they send kids to me for aerial silks classes and and the kids just don't get the ability to even hang. And I, I run my students through this drill. It's called the dead bug. And they have to move one arm on one side and their leg on the opposite side. And so many of them can't do it, that cross body movement. And I start teaching at age seven. So these are kids that are in school and they're probably struggling with reading and probably struggling with a whole lot else because the two sides of their brain aren't talking to each other. You've got to get that movement in there. You have to help them. That will help them actually to organize their thoughts. And, and I would say, um, you know, at four and a half, yes, play, play a lot, but also your child probably already has some very um, deep interests dive into those interests with your child, explore them. You have, you don't, you're not even required to do school right now. So just play um, and enjoy learning about those subjects that they are most interested in because it's going to fuel them to want to learn more and um, just allow the rabbit trails to happen and follow them with your child. And if they have a sibling then um, just go on that adventure that the younger ones, they just follow suit. I found that I was homeschooling my older two when my youngest was born. And she, the week she turned three, she goes, where's my books? Because <laughs> it had become a way of life now in our house. And um, that's just what she wanted to do. I was telling the woman that I had coffee with last night, I said, by the time she finished high school, she almost had two transcripts to fill because she had done so much um, in her, her homeschool career that was at high school level. And I, we had to pick and choose what we included on that. Um, and and so that that's just exciting, you know, to be able to give them such a broad range of of knowledge and understanding and, and experiences. And that's really what it's all about. You know, why not um, give your students the ability to, to try new things in the safety, in the environment of your own home, and, um, and to really, really know what they do well at, what supports they need, and what fuels them to, to serve and, and to to help others to um, to continue to grow and and to um, and to be who God made them to be. So, so think about about those things too. Um, let's see. I think I had one more question that was submitted, or maybe that was it. I think that was the last one. I'm gonna check my email though, just in case, because I think there was another one that was submitted later on. And I want to make sure that I also get to, um, to that question as well, because I, I hate when my question's not, um, put in there. Um, okay. Yes, there was one more. It says, what are some great executive functioning resources for families to use to help a child with organization? Um, I would say the best um, thing to do would we had a I had an, an interview a couple months ago on executive functioning. You have to listen to that interview. Um, so go back either in the podcast or on the YouTube channel. Just search um, search our YouTube channel channel for executive functioning and and try to find that interview because. My guest shared a lot of really good information more than I'm just I'm just not an expert. Um, <laughs> I've answered a lot of these questions. I can tell you more about homeschool law than I can about um, about all the different teaching methodologies because there's there's just so many. And um, 
and depending on the needs of your child, it's going to depend on which of our broadcasts, which of the, the experts I've interviewed that you should really listen to because there's just a lot of information there. Um, and if you were to try to listen to all my past episodes, it, it'd be like drinking out of a fire hose. Um, and it, you know, eventually you, you may come up with something else and, and then search for it again. Our blogs on, on the Sped Homeschool website are the, the same. Just just do a search on our website and you'll find a lot of information there. Um, I had a call um, come through uh, my emails. It was a couple days ago and a parent was asking me, how do I start homeschooling? That's a pretty common question that a lot of people are asking right now. Um, and so I'm going to tell you my answer. And um, hopefully that will help you if you're asking that question. How do I start homeschooling? Okay, let's talk about that, especially with a special needs child. She um, rattled off two different diagnoses, one for each of her children, and they were pretty severe. Um, and a lot of people think, you know, oh, I can't homeschool a child with, you know, more severe, profound learning issues. Yes, you can. Um, and especially if God is telling you that this is where he's calling you. I don't want to convince you that homeschooling is the best option if God's not calling you to do that. God will equip where he calls. If you're doing it out of fear or anxiety and God has told you to keep your kids in school, to go to a private school, then you're going against his will and he will not honor you dis your disobedience. So think about that first. Um Homeschooling is an amazing option. It is something I'm a proponent of, yes. But does God call everyone to homeschool? No, he does not. Um, and that's a hard thing to say because it um, it's such an amazing experience. But, um, but prayerfully think about that and think about it every year too. It isn't just like God says, no, then this is the end of it. Ask, seek, knock, listen, um, and see what he does. Um, that is the best advice I can give you. Where his peace is, is where everything will flourish for both you and your children. And it may not be the same answer for every child as well. So many families now are homeschooling one child, two children. The other ones are going to private schools, public schools, cottage schools, just crazy stuff. Um, and so don't feel like it's just cut and dried. One child is, you know, this is what they, we need to do with them. So we're going to do with everybody. Well, take that before God too. So how do you start homeschooling? Well, the first thing I always ask parents is what state do you live in? Because that determines a lot on how I'm, I'm going to answer that question. Why? Well, here's why. Sorry. The reason is, is because the homeschooling law in every state is mandated by the state. And so even though there's an overarching education department, they do not regulate the, the law within each state. So each state can say, what is legal for home education? Some states require reporting, um, being underneath a teacher, an umbrella school, um, some require that you teach certain subjects, keep attendance, um, hand in report cards. There's a variety of different things. Some states have no requirements at all, at least reporting requirements. Now, the best place to go is to your state organization and, and to find out what the laws are in your state. And um, a lot of state um, organizations also have the ability for you to be able to look on their website. They'll tell you the state laws, and they a lot of times will have a form you can fill out to, um, to tell the public school, the private school, that you're unenrolling your child. Um, and it's what's legally required. A lot of times if you tell the public school, if you're withdrawing a child that you're going to homeschool, they'll give you a packet like inches thick of all this information that legally they can't even ask from you. So, so really go to your state homeschooling organization and, um, and figure out what that, um, 
those laws are. If you don't know what your state homeschooling organization is, I would say go to Homeschool Legal Defense Association, that's hslda.org, and um, search by your state for homeschool law, and they'll be able to tell you what your law is. And um, they also have state organizations that they they work with um, that, that are, the, they're the feet on the ground that are fighting for the continuing freedom for your right to homeschool. So um, so that's the first place you start if you want to start homeschooling is figuring out what your state law is. Now, um, you're going to have to to follow whatever your state laws are. Um, when I lived in Minnesota, we were required to do testing every year. If our child fell below the 30th percentile there, then we had to um, keep within our own records how we were going to help that child with the areas that they struggled in that fell below that 30th percentile. So I would either just change up my curriculum or write some goals for that student and, and how I was going to help that child to um, to reach those goals for the coming year. Didn't mean that they were going to be at grade level, but it was going to be more of a focus of our education because those were areas of struggle. Um, and, and that's all that was required in that state. We moved to Texas. There was no reporting anymore. Um, and we were just required to use a bona fide curriculum and that just meant that anything we were teaching was actually te something we were teaching. It wasn't just a scam <laughs> saying, oh, yes, we taught our kids and they signed a paper and you didn't have to do anything. Um, no. And that we had to teach five um, subjects, reading, writing, math, um, spelling, and good citizenship. And and so just know that every, every state has different laws, different requirements. If you have a child that struggles, sometimes they're going to ask you to show proof of progress and different states require different things for that. So again, if um, you're trying to figure that out, go to um, the Homeschool Legal Defense Association or hslda.org and you can find out what your homeschool laws are. Now, whether your homeschool laws required or not, there are best practices that we as homeschoolers need to follow. Um, and that includes keeping track of what your kids are doing and making sure they are progressing and being diligent. Um, that's just something as a, a child of God that when we're called to do something, we should do it with everything that's in us. And, and so we do it with purpose and we, we do it because we know that even if we're not accountable to the government, we are accountable to God because he gave these children to us. And so we do it with everything we do with our heart, our soul, our mind, um, and our strength. So um, those are our best practices. And we at Sped Homeschool can help you with some of those best practices. We actually have a free download on our website. We actually have a lot of free downloads on our website, but one of them is an IEP, an Individualized Education Plan. And you can use that form to not only um, write what would be the equivalent of a, a public school IEP um, for your homeschool. A lot of times in states, your homeschool is considered a, a private school, you have your own requirements. And of course, that IEP is not going to hold your public school responsible for any services that you write in there, but it's going to hold you responsible. And you have to think about that. What goals do I have for my child? How are we going to reach them? How are we going to track those? Those are things you record in there. Um, also, you're going to record, you know, behavioral uh, modifications that you're, you're adding in, different assistive technology your student uses. Why would you do this? Well, because you're creating history. I have a lot of broadcast podcasts that we've talked about this IEP and the need for it. Um, a lot of parents, we found even when I was working with the Texas Homeschool Coalition, a lot of parents were asked by the social service um, administration where their IEP was for their child because they wouldn't give them funding until they had one. And some of them had to go back and create them in order to to get funds for their student that they needed. So um, again, like I said, this is the best practice. It's not required, but you're creating that history. And the more you create history of your child needing a specific accommodation um, of, of having this struggle, for a long period of time, what um, any testing that was done that that has validated that, um, if you need to advocate or your your child needs to advocate um, in a college setting when they're taking a college entrance exam, 
that history means a lot. So, so don't just think, oh, this is just another piece of paperwork. Actually, when you download our IEP template off of our website at spedhomeschool.com, we send you a series of emails that walks you through step by step actually how to write it. So we'll, we'll send you something one every like day, every other day, and you'll go, okay, today, this is why I'm going to write this section now. So when you get to the goals, we'll send you links to goal banks and you can pick and choose from that. That's what teachers use when they write the IEPs in the public schools. Why shouldn't you? Um, and, and so we give you all of those things so that you can easily do that and, and have that document so that you have that ability to, to show that history and to be able to advocate um, with a greater degree the needs that your child has for learning. So, um, so those are just um, some things that I wanted to share with you um, that had come across um, my desk at least recently. I'm going to see if there's there's any other, if you have any other questions, if you're watching live, I see that we have a couple of people. Um, because my guests did not show up today, <laughs> I'm just kind of doing a little Q&A and answering some of the questions that came in for my guest as best I can. A lot of times just referring um, to, to previous episodes and, and how to search our YouTube channel and the Sped Homeschool website. But, uh, but also just some things, some recent conversations that I have had um, with, with various people, whether it's been um, at, at SPED Homeschool or um, just at church. And um, yeah, we just, we get, we get a lot of people asking questions. Um, the one question that I will say, if you call SPED Homeschool and you ask if your child can enroll, no, they can't because we don't actually have a curriculum. Um, that's, that's kind of one of those, those crazy things um, that um, we get questions about all the time. But um, we are a parent resource um, organization. So, of course, we don't teach your kids. Um, that, that is your calling. <laughs> um, one other question I had from a parent that I, I thought I would throw in is that some states do require standardized testing. And they usually require tests that um, that are that can then compare your child to a, a certain the age group, the grade level um, demographic, so they know where they are at. You know that percentile number. And a lot of parents ask me which test is the best. And I have to say that there's a couple different ones. The Peabody tends to be my favorite, although you need to find someone who can administer that test. Um, there are some other ones now that have come about that um, even some that you can do online. The Peabody, though, is um, super easy because it's interactive. My kids kind of thought of it more like a game show. <laughs> there was this little flip chart, and the first year it took a little bit longer because the um, the tester had to figure out where they were at um, because my kids were usually across the board in places where my son, when when he tested out as a non-reader, um, he was up in the 11th, 12th grade range for science. And, and so, so anyways, you know, by the next year when we came in, she's like, oh, I know where to start, you know, testing this student um, because of where they left off last year. And, and so that, um, that's, that's helpful. But, um, but yes, there's a, a lot of tests that, um, that aren't very conducive, especially to kids that have learning issues, just because they, there's a lot of, a lot of like fill in the blank or not fill in the blank, but the, the multiple choice. And sometimes they read into it too much. I have those children. <laughs> and so the, the conversational type testing tended to work out better. Um, so, so that was um, one of those, those questions that I, we had got recently. Um, and so I think, that's it. One another question had come in um, about accommodations in college and about needing um, needing a diagnosis. So we tend to get a lot of these too, especially as you finish up high school. You know, what do I need to have in place um, as I as I'm graduating? So maybe that's a, a good thing to wrap up with. Um, a lot of people, what what's high school requirements? 
Well, since you are the private school in most states and you set the graduation requirements, you decide. And and so if your state, you know, the public schools say you need this many years of this, this many years, you know, math and science and you're not required to do that if your state does not set those requirements for homeschoolers. So know the distinction and the difference between that. Now, that doesn't mean that your transcript can have anything on it because it really depends on where your student's going to go next. And what do they need on that transcript for wherever they're going? If they're going to go to a job, what would the job be looking for? And um, so, like I said a while ago, my daughter had enough credits to fill two transcripts, so we had to pick and choose. Um, and at first, it didn't really matter because she wanted to be a tattoo artist. And I was like, well, you know, we can do that fashion design stuff there, you know, all of all these very creative things. You can put whatever you want. Well, then she changed tracks this last year and decided that she was going to go to college and um, and go into archival sciences. So. Yes, putting down that she took a whole um, year on art history and um, in, in the United States um, kind of art history. And and so, yes, that was important to have in her transcript for for that um, and some more of her art classes and and other things. So um, because, of course, now she needs to go through the application process to go into a college. And so we, we had to change a couple of things that we didn't have in the original transcript for, for that. Um, still classes she had taken, but we had not seen them as being important to put in there. So really what is on your student's transcript, what you're teaching towards is what they think their end goal is. And I, I want to emphasize this, what they think their end goal is not what their end goal is because a lot of them have no idea. <laughs> um, my story with my oldest and it just made me almost cry because I went into this, how to homeschool your child through high school. And pretty much the people leading the, the seminar said, well, you have to know what your child wants to do when they graduate high school, because then you're going to develop your four year plan from there. And I thought he has no idea. He maybe is guessing at this point. Maybe he wants to go into the military. I don't think that's going to work. But um, I kind of left crying and really had no idea and spent a lot of time with God over that. And what I realized was we had to shoot for something, at least in the first year. I wasn't even going to put the transcript together till we had finished the first year. And that's what I do recommend now for parents who are teaching high school for the first year, don't bother because sometimes you're going to change tracks. I had my middle child thought, oh, yes, I'm going to do information technology for an entire year. Well, that lasted about six weeks until he got totally bored and said, I think I'd rather build my own computer. Um, we were tracking the hours that he was doing for all this computer stuff. And after we realized he had enough credits in a variety of different computer things, we figured out what we could call that class for that credit hour <laughs> based on what he did. And we just called it um, um, Computer 101 or something like that. It was, you know, um, and then put it on his transcript like that because things are going to change. They're going to change a lot um, unless you have one of those diehard dedicated students that really want knows what they want to do from day one of high school. And there aren't many <laughs> that do. Um, so so just kind of set your sights and just know that those sites will probably change. And so first year he said, you know, I want to be in the military. Well, what does the military require on a transcript? Let's try to get that in for this year. And then the next year he said, no, I think I want to be an underwater welder. <laughs> Let's shift. Okay. So maybe you should go to the public high school and take some welding and shop classes. And, um, and we had the opportunity to do that when we lived in Minnesota. And so just just including a variety of different things. So then the next year he decided, you know, I think I want to be a welder. Um, and, and so his last year of high school, that fourth year, he actually went to welding school instead of being at home. And then he came home and decided he wanted to be an engineer. Um, but thankfully, you know, praying through this, and I just, I really want to encourage you, pray, pray, pray through everything that you put before your kids. I did. I pushed him in calculus. I pushed him in the things he was good at, even though, 
I saw no need for those, but he just got a lot of joy out of doing them. And I was very thankful when he said he wanted to go to college, be an engineer, that we had that calculus on his transcript. Um, so, so, you know, the Holy Spirit will lead and um, you will finish with what you need. You just have to trust when, when God's in the process, you will have what's necessary. It, it, um, it's going to be a little bit of a messy process because you're not going to know you have to do it in faith. And I just want to encourage you from, from that point of view. Um, we're, you're starting out a new year, everybody. Um, whether you're new to homeschooling, you've been doing this for a while. Um, there's still things ahead that you just don't know, but God knows. So trust him in that. Trust that he already has these things figured out. Don't feel like you have to fill your schedule with things just to make sure it's full when your school year starts. If you don't know what to teach um, for some subjects, start with what you have. You will figure it out with other things. It's just like managers are told, don't fill a position with somebody who's just okay, wait for the right person, because you're going to have to, you're going to spend money on that curriculum that you don't really like. You're going to waste time trying to make something fit that doesn't really fit well, when you could have spent time on the things that were working and just immerse yourself in them and enjoy doing them. And, and then you'll have space for those things when they do come along the right thing and, and you can embrace it, you can run with it and you'll have the time and the energy and the space for it. So, um, so that's my, my final encouragement for you in this hour we've had together. So, um, lots of questions, um, that were submitted. I'm glad I was able to get to all of those. I just want to encourage you, um, if you haven't checked out our website, go to spedhomeschool.com. We do have a lot of downloads. We kind of changed the format of our our website in the last year, actually since March. So, um, so the resources on there, we have lots of articles. We have lots of guides, checklists, downloads, those types of things. Um, the, my upcoming broadcast schedule and different guests that I, I have scheduled, um, I'm just hoping they all show up, um, will, will become, is on, on there. You can figure out who's coming up. You can submit questions ahead of time. That's how the questions that I addressed today were submitted was through that form. And, and then just search our YouTube channel. You can go onto YouTube to sped homeschool and, and search. We have over a thousand videos, I think 1.3 thousand videos on our YouTube channel. So some of them are pretty old, have to (laughs) apologize ahead of time for some of the video quality. Um, But, but the content is amazing. And that's why we don't take it down because there's just so much good stuff on there. So search, search for what you need that we my goal was to create a database for you. And that's what Sped Homeschool has become. It's been a database of information just for parents like you who are searching for resources, for answers on how to home educate um, a child with just learning differences and, and just know that you can do it. And so going back to that question, can I homeschool a child with learning challenges and special educational needs? Yes. Yes, you can. And we are here to help. So thanks all for joining me. I'm Peggy Ployer. I'm the founder and CEO of Sped Homeschool. I'm so glad to um, have had this hour with you. It's been a treat to just be able to share some of the things that have been on my heart and um, and to answer your questions. And then I'll be back with the guest next week. Um, we are going to talk, let's see, about, um, oh, this is a good one. We're going to talk about find the secret of to finding calm in the homeschool chaos and my guest will be Kristen Lavalley so you'll definitely want to join us for that and just be encouraged that there is a way to find calm in the chaos and um, but we have to be purposeful about it it doesn't just come on its own <laughs> um, God is there and he creates the calm but sometimes we get so caught up in the chaos that it um, it gets lost so Anyways, so I'll see you next week for that episode. Um, It'll be back on Tuesday at our regular time. So see you then, everybody. God bless and um, take care. 
to take just a second to thank the team at Life Audio for their partnership with us on this podcast. If you go to lifeaudio.com, you'll find dozens of other faith-centered podcasts in their network. They've got shows about prayer, Bible study, parenting, and more. This has been Empowering Homeschool Conversations with Peggy Ployer. What happens when a writer and former history teacher goes toe-to-toe with his best friend, a nationally touring stand-up comedian? Total carnage, that's what. Two men enter and two men leave because that's how it works. (laughs) Actually, you get hilarious, real, and insightful conversations about life, history, culture, faith, and everything in between. Join me, comedian Johnny W., and my pal, author and speaker John Driver for Talk About That at lifeaudio.com or wherever you get your podcasts.